Now here's how it's implemented with the three-bit Barker codes. Who's Barker? Well, this guy Barker went when before we able to l implement digital linear pulse compression systems. Uh, Barker, the, these phase codes were implemented a lot. And by the way, just because they're not implemented today doesn't mean there aren't an extremely large number of operational systems in the world that use these different codes. That's why I'm teaching it. I'm not teaching you about uh, mercury delay lines and uh, quartz delay lines for uh, signal processing stuff when we've got digital memories we can store stuff in. Uh, I'm not going to go to the 50s archaic stuff because that stuff isn't even used at all today. It's it's that archaic. But for this stuff, you know, um, this is this is these kinds of binary phase coded and more than three bit Barker codes are in systems out in the field today. So what we do is we take a pulse, we divide it up into three pieces. First, excuse me, I want to say what do I mean by a three bit Barker code? I mean that we divide the, the time up into three sub-pulses. And the, uh, the three-bit Barker codes, the Barker codes have a specific characteristics that they have uniform side lobes. And that's why Barker got his, his name attached to them. Okay? And what you do is you just change or don't change the phase according to this code as you transmit the pulse. So now say we transmit out a pulse which has uh, a plus, a plus, and a minus and and what we do is we pass this pulse through this you get a zero then the output's a minus one, then a zero, then a three and then a zero and then a minus one and then a zero so the matched filter output, it's the convolution of the of the the convolution of the pulse we just do digitally. And the output you see you gain factor of three, six dB. And here we see the re, re, the the compressed pulse in blue. And then after you compress it you send it out, transmit it, and then decompress it by sending it through a time reversed um, uh, shift registers and what have you. Usually uh, binary phase codes, what they do is they clip the amplitude, forget about it, and just put ones in here. Uh, and that was, that was imp obviously implemented before uh, the 60s and 70s when Moore's Law would let us use amplitude in signal processing systems and not throw away the amplitude, just use the phase to get good resolution. Now a 13-bit Barker code is probably the most used because it gives you quite good side lobes and it, it, excuse me for this typo where I have a capital T here overlapping a uh, side lobe level. I'll change that in the uh, uh, the PDFs. Here is, here is the code for a 13-bit Barker code. And it is interesting. It gives you pretty good darn good side lobes, 22.3 dB side lobes, and pulse compression ratio of 13. So you can get 13 dB better resolution and get 22.3 22 side lobes. And the autocorrelation uh, of the above pulse represents the output of the matched filter. Okay. Now you can implement these with tap delay lines where you hold in uh, a little memory uh, and, and in the olden days they'd hold the uh, one bit but you could hold certainly now amplitudes and we, uh, here, we, here what we do is we change the sign or not change it according to the code and then the output is summed with the 13-bit Barker code and and the output the matched filter input comes out here if we have the general pulse here the matched filter input comes here and the output bar, uh, waveform with the Barker code comes out here 
and the time between subpulses is tau, and so we have uh, uh, 13 dB extra in resolution. And here are all the Barker codes. You can see them with their side load levels. And we change the phase 0 or pi that result in equal time side lobes called Barker codes. The side lobe level is uh, 1 over n squared, that of the peak, and n is the code length, and another, none exists greater than 13. Now, we have, let's look at range side lobe comparisons. Uh, binary phase coded waveforms with a 7 bit Barker code. Um, here's the output of pulse compression it, with a linear FM waveform that's unweighted. You'd see here's the output 13 dB side lobes, but if you take a linear FM waveform and put a good weighting side lobes on them, hamming weighting, you're getting down 40 dB ish. So someone would use, uh, rather than a 7-bit Barker code, you'd use the linear FM waveform. So that shows you that you get better range side lobes with the linear FM. Now let's look at some other, in the next few minutes, different kinds of coded waveforms that are used in different radars for different reasons. They're used in communications too. There are linear recursive sequences, shift register codes, they're used for length greater than n. The shift registered with feedback modulo to arithmetic just generates a pseudorandom sequence of ones and zeros of length 2 to the n minus 1. And that uh, n is the number of stages in the shift register. And there, it also goes by many other names, uh, pseudorandom noise codes, uh, pseudo noise sequences, binary shift registers linear recursive sequence codes, they're all the same thing. And the different feedback paths and initial settings yield different sequences with different side lobe levels. A 7-bit shift register for generating a pseudorandom linear recursive sequence with n equals 127 will give you 24 bits. And they're sometimes used for different, you'll, you hear these words, but you don't see them too much. Uh, you can have quadraphase codes where you don't shift plus zero or pi, but you shift not binary, but four phases, pi over two or three pi over two. And they fall off, uh, they're used to alleviate some of the problems in binary phase codes like poor fall off of the radiation pattern, mismatch losses in the pulse compression filter, and the loss in range sampling, which I just showed you. And so between subpulse to subpulse, you could have a phase change of pi over 2, and each pulse has a half of a cosine shape rather than uh, a rectangular, and range straddling losses are reduced if you use quadraphase codes. And then we get on to even further more complicated co codes, and these are phase quantizations less than pi radians. And they introduce even lower range side lobes than binary phase coded. They're tolerant to Doppler frequency shifts if the frequencies aren't too great. And uh, here's an M by M matrix defining the Frank polyphase code where you read off the phases. The phases of up to M squared subpulses are read starting from the upper left of the matrix and reading each row in succession from left to right, and uh, phases are modulo 360 degrees. So, uh, and you just take the numbers you get and modulo 360, and that would be your your M by M uh, polyphase Frank codes, if ever you hear them. And lastly, there are I think this is the last Costas codes where the frequencies within a subpulse are changed in a prescribed manner. The pulse length T is divided into M continuous subpulses. The frequency of each subpulse is selected from M contiguous frequencies, and the frequencies are separated by reciprocals of the subpulse. And there are the bandwidth divided by M different frequencies, and with these relationships for the width of the subpulse and the pulse compression ratio. And the Costas method is developed to, as a selection which minimizes both range and Doppler side lobes.
If you'd like more than these relatively short descriptions of these different, more complex codes, there's about a page on each of the codes in uh, Merlet Skolnick's Introduction to Radar Systems. And I'm giving them uh, somewhat short shrift. And in, um, in, 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 if you're used to coding waveforms for communications, you may be more used to these and codes on pulses. Um, but in radar, don't see them that often. I haven't in my career. They may come back into vogue, but just wanted. Here are some others. And there are lots of others that you, you expect, and they're covered in the text, and each have their strengths and weaknesses. And here is a list of them. Uh, you do want and you get it maybe named after you. You have Huffman codes and Welty codes and uh, Doppler tolerant pulse compression codes. Non, you have nonlinear FM pulse compression and nonlinear bi, bi, binary phase coded sequences. Variants of the Barker code and techniques for minimizing, minimizing side lobes with phase coded waveforms. All sorts of different things have been, you know, people have published papers on them and I'm sure Merrill uh, gives references and I'm sure hopefully someone got at least a master's degree for them. And the, but there was probably some good specific use for their being developed. Now in summary, simultaneously high average power and good range resolution you can get with pulse compression techniques. Main takeaway, the modulation of longer pulses in frequency or phase are techniques that often are used for pulse compression. So like that is most of the time it's probably frequency, uh, linear FM, but phase is used too today. And phase encoding a log pulse can be useful to divide into binary encoded subpulses. And linear frequency FM is used most of the time. It's what I see now. And as I mentioned, there's a variety of other methods. Here are the ones I've run into in my uh, uh, 40 years working in radar. Uh, and it probably goes in, in uh, after these in this order in terms of how I've not run across them. Now for references, all the main references, and uh, particularly I want to bring your attention to waveforms and signal processing. Um, I read these books, one, two, three, four, five, and a couple of that they don't print anymore. I wish I had Mark Richards' book on the fundamentals of radar signal processing uh, to take as a course. He is a great author and did a great job on this book, and other people have said so. And by the way, since this course is is published by myself. I am not speaking for the uh, IEEE New Hampshire section, the Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society, nor my former employee, the Lincoln Laboratory of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Those, uh, it's my own personal view. Neat book. Uh, to young people who want to learn about radar signal processing, that's where I send them. And a good friend of mine, if you can believe it, I have known Roger. 50 years, more than 50 years, 52 years, we met as undergraduates at MIT, and Roger has written a fantastic book. Uh, the main sequence of, the main piece of it is to talk about synthetic aperture signal processing, of which Roger's been a significant contributor throughout his career. And, uh, but he has a lot of signal processing background in it and radar background to build up to that work that he's done uh, on, on um, synthetic aperture radar stuff. And it's, I heartily recommend Roger's book. And it's out in paperback now. You can get it from SciTech. And lastly, I'd like to thank Randy Avent. Um, I uh, reviewed a, a lecture that Randy gave at Lincoln Laboratory. And once you review something, it's up here. And so, uh, and all the other people at Lincoln Laboratory, of course, who have taught me. but. Uh, most importantly, Randy, uh, who has taught this lecture before. And uh, of course, I have to thank Merrill Skolnick's book, who, which has been the Bible for me. I have, I learned radar out of R R Merrill Skolnick's edition one. And when I had to go to a reference back from that, it was the, uh, MIT Radiation Lab series, of which I, uh, I don't have, ah, here's one. Thank you.
love to put in a, a plug for this. Here's the book. I hope you all can see it. Um, after World War II, and this is Propagation of Short Waves by Kerr, and it's, uh, it's too darkened to see which of the 22 volumes it is. But after the MIT Radiation Laboratory was dissolved, I don't think I talk about this in Lecture 1, um, in the late mid to late 40s, uh, the, the people that worked at the Radiation Laboratory put together all they knew about radar that was unclassified. And for and it came, 22 volumes about this wide, you can actually buy it on a DVD or a CD. Um, so it's a, uh, but it's it's not that useless because it's got pictures of tubes everywhere. But this basic stuff like um, propagation, it's still darn good. And and the uh, Rindau's radar systems book. If you want to get a, get a feel for how tough it was to do signal processing, which is going to be our next subject, you you, you look at the uh, the chapter uh, the book on. Um, uh, on uh, MTI radar receivers. I'll tell you a neat uh, uh, anecdote as we argue. First of all, here are the homework problems in Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 from Merrill Skolnick's book. Um, uh, I, my thesis advisor, I was a physics major in undergraduate and graduate school, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania. And a number of the professors in physics at the University of Pennsylvania had been members of the MIT Radiation Laboratory. And my thesis advisor, uh, Professor Emeritus Walter Selov, had worked uh, in radar. And I really didn't know it when I went to work for him as a thesis advisor. I never knew I'd be working in radar after I got out of graduate school. And we would have, from time to time, graduate school you know, parties. And, uh, and you know, working the usual 70 hour weeks. And it, when they were collecting data, 80, 90, it was just uh, unbelievable. If you've gotten a PhD, you know what it's like uh, to be a serif. But anyway, we have these blasts. And whenever a Walter would have, he'd be starting his third old granddad on the rocks. He would start to talk about how brutally difficult it was to make these MTI radar receivers, and that would be 30 years before when he was working in the radar in the radiation laboratory at MIT. <laughs> and I, of course, didn't know three sheets from the winds what was so big about a radar MTI receiver. And it turns out, when I got out of graduate school, was the 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 uh, the market was very bad for um, pure physicists who wanted to go into basic physics. And, uh, and so I went into the work, uh, into radar, first starting at MITRE, if you see my bibliography. And, and when I was at MITRE, I, I looked up in Skolnick's book, in, in the, excuse me, the first edition of Skolnick's handbook, when I was learning about MTI radar receivers, and who do I see referenced? But Walter Selov, chapter 13 of the uh, of the book, so I get them out of the MITRE library. Sure enough, Walter Selov wrote a chapter in one of these books. And my thesis advisor, and the circle turned, and of course I had to call Walt on the phone and say, Hey, Walt! <laughs> Finally learned what the guy did during the Rad Lab. Anyway, uh, so that will sort of uh, will close the anecdotal part, and let's see if we have any more for you.